Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Ferb is a distinguished computer scientist of this country and the world. During the last 40 years, he has made enormous contributions to the computer science and the industry. In all of your pocket, you at least have one chip made by Steve. Today, Steve will present to us his pioneering work on a brain-like computer systems called uh, Spinnak. Building brains, learning from data is the title of the discussion, how computers can learn from data. We're, of course, seeing more and more computers used in interactive sensory roles. But how far can we take this? This is hopefully what we'll, we'll, we'll learn about this afternoon. Without further ado, though, Professor Steve Feather. <laughs> to start the talk, um, here's a quote from 200 years ago. I have my hopes, and very distinct ones, too of one day getting cerebral phenomena such that I can put them into mathematical equations. In short, a law or laws for the mutual actions of the molecules of brain. I hope to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. Unfortunately, she died at the tender age of 36 and never delivered um, on this aspiration. If she had lived a little bit longer and succeeded in these goals, then she'd have saved a lot of us a lot of time since. Building machines to display human intelligence has turned out much harder than Alan Turing imagined, and much harder than many people have thought. And my take on this, my personal view, is that the reason we found it so difficult to build machines that display artificial human-like intelligence is because we've never really worked out what natural human intelligence is. We have a very broad idea of what we mean when we use the word, but we do not know how it works biologically, and therefore it's proved very difficult to replicate it in machines. Spinnaker is a sort of crude contraction of spiking neural network architecture, so it's not quite an acronym, um, and I always spell it with capital N's just to emphasize that it's about neural networks and not about yachting. The goal of the Spinnaker project from the outset has been uh, to put um, a large amount of computing into a single machine and the target has been a million mobile phone processors. With a million mobile phone processors, just so you get the scale of the problem of, of trying to understand the human brain, um, you get, with a million processors you get to about 1% of the scale you would need to build a whole human brain model. These are expensive and difficult things to design. Uh, this square centimetre of silicon represents about 40 man years of design effort. Um, over a five-year period. One of my claims for uh, this style of research is you get more PhDs to the square millimetre than most other subjects. <laughs> um, we've built a, a, a stack of software that will take a high-level description of the brain region expressed in a language which the computational neuroscientists already use, um, and then we build the tools that automatically map these networks onto the machine and decide where to put things onto the machine um, to make it all run. 15 years in conception and eight years in construction, um, but now it's built and ready to go. All it needs is some interesting challenges to address. Why are we building a machine to understand the brain? There are, there are a number of answers to that, of which the first simple one is scientific curiosity. Perhaps more economically significant is that brain disease is economically more e significant to the developed economies than cancer, heart disease, and diabetes put together, mm -hmm. okay, in terms of... Uh, its economic cost. Um, so there's lots of good reasons for wanting to understand enough about the brain to be able to develop treatments and therapies that, that might alleviate that cost. And of course, economic cost is one way of measuring it, but the, the quality of life impact of, of, of brain diseases is, is, is anything far more significant to those affected. Steve, I, I just want to pick up on something you said. One of the reasons um, strong a AI is so elusive is we don't really know what the I means yet. Once we do understand the brain better, strong a AI is not far off. Is that correct? There's still quite a lot of controversy about um, how deeply you have to go into the biological system before you get the root of intelligence. I'm not at all convinced that intelligence is a, sim a simple physical quantity that can be amplified. Okay, I think, I think intelligence is, is, is uh, we don't know what it is, all right, but, but I think it's far more subtle than that. And, and if you imagine that you had a hyper-intelligent machine, what would it do? 
Okay? Um, what would be the sign that it was more intelligent than us? Mm. Um, you know, would it find the political solution to problems in the Middle East? Uh, it's hard to imagine that that would emerge from this kind of intelligence. So, so, so these but, guys, the Elon Musk, and let's face it, Stephen Hawkins, th throw them in there as well, they, they need to calm down a little bit about I, it. I think they need to calm down. Okay. And, and it's clear that, that human intelligence is manifest in many different forms. It's not just an ability to do hard maths or play chess well. You know, there's some form of intelligence involved in being able to kick a leather ball off a spot into the back of a net, right? Indeed, as far as current evidence goes, that's the form of intelligence most valued by human society. <laughs> <laughs> um, even in the limit, if we fully understand how the human brain generates in human intelligence and we can replicate it in a machine, it's not at all clear to me that the machine will be brighter, it'll be any, any cleverer. Okay. I, we're really struggling to get it, you know, we're really struggling to get machines that can come anywhere close to fruit fly in terms of intelligence. Okay. So it's a very, very poor substitute for a biological brain. You know, biological brains fit neatly inside your skull and run on about 25 watts. <laughs> the speed with which we got to soft AI, self-driving cars, vacuum cleaners, bearing that in mind, does that make you hopeful that we'll get to strong AI sooner or quickly? I'm reasonably optimistic that, that we will get to the root of the processes that underpin human intelligence on the timescale of a decade or two. Uh, because the processes we're using are really quite small. I mean, the, these are um, you know, the smaller processes you'd find in your phone, not the big one. The number I should frighten you with is the fact that each of these processes has 32 kilobytes of code space, um, which tells you something about the operating system. It, it isn't Windows. Um, <laughs> al although, you know, the, the, today's undergraduate comes in and you say, here's a machine, it's got 32 kilobytes of code space, go and make it do something spectacular. And they say, how could you possibly do something in 32 kilobytes? At this point, I get out my trusty BBC Micro <laughs> and show them what David Braben did with Elite in less than 32 kilobytes. You know, it's, it's, it's actually quite a lot of resource, even though by today's standards, it's tiny. Yeah. I mean, Spinnaker is not going to tell you how the brain works, but it's a machine that can be used to test hypotheses that people generate about aspects of brain function. But as a tool for understanding, it's justified. As a replacement, I don't think it's, I think it's a non-starter. Biology, of course, hasn't been designed in the same way. Um, it's developed in ways that means it often cheats. It often breaks abstraction rules to achieve function. Uh, but even so, if we, if we want to understand something as complex as, as, as the brain, we have to hope that there are valid abstractions. If we really have to go down to the... the um, cellular biochemistry and every neuron in the brain, then we're, then we're sunk for centuries. <laughs> so, you see, again, her, her, again, this is research and optimism. You have to believe this is a tractable problem. If, 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 if things like you know, quantum effects in microtubules are really important, then we're on the hiding to nothing. Thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. It was a, a fantastic talk from Steve. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Steve Ferber.